Gary, tell me, tell me about this. this. This is the trail that she was found on? Yeah, so she was found uh, down this trail um, in uh, May 22nd in 2019. Uh, the sheriff's office received the 911 call uh, in the late afternoon, and uh, I think deputies showed up about 4 o'clock that day um, when they got the call. And so she was found down this trail. Um, there was only thing that we found on the trail was uh, ATV tire impressions. That was it. What a ways back in here. Oh yeah, yeah. It was this. This was really. Uh, it was strange for her to be, even be in the woods, but um, the area that she was found definitely. That even her family had said that she wouldn't even come back here. So she was. Uh, Scared of the woods, scared of snakes, scared of animals, that kind of stuff. You said even even at home when she mowed the grass, she was scared of snakes there. So yeah. Even carry a gun there. Yeah, yeah. The family then you know had said that she always had a pistol with her even when she was cutting her grass, and then uh, we later uh, did a search warrant on her house and uh, found the pistol inside the house. So her being brought back here by our suspect, um, this was this was the end of it for her on. Uh, Last time anybody had seen her. First of all, sir, your name? Gary Sharpen. Just spell your last name, Gary? S-H-A-R-P-E-N. Gary, tell me about this case. You started out this in 2019. Kind of give me from beginning to what it went through. Yeah, so we got a call of a, uh, a, a woman was found in the National Forest, and um, she was found deceased. Uh, we showed up, and immediately we grew suspicious of the nature and the cause of death due to the fact that the way she was found, the way her body was basically uh, mutilated. What transpired from that point? I mean, uh, she was, how was she found? She was found face down. Uh, she was scalped. She was fully clothed. Uh, she was right off of a uh, small little pipeline trail. Um, it was commonly used for uh, people to go out there walking, ATVs, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, it was in a small community in Shepherd. Um, right next to the National Forest. Uh, so there was a lot of, um, it was a wide open trail. Um, it was commonly used. And there was, the way she was found um, was very disturbing. What about, what led y'all to, to her? How, how did, what was initially? The well, the, the reason, initially we found out the day before she had had a couple of uh, dogs that had gotten loose and these dogs had um, ran off apparently into the National Forest, which is just right across from her, where her house was at. So she had uh, asked for some help with some neighbors and uh, our suspect had volunteered to help her. And uh, we were able to confirm that with through eyewitnesses and, and cell phone records and that kind of stuff to, to put us in touch with him. Now, okay, your suspect, he was, he was one of the four, other four wheeler. Yes, it was, his, yes, it was, it, was, it Person we have in custody is Robert Clary. Um, he was uh, he was last seen with her the day before her body was found, and he was the one that actually found her body on the trail, off the trail in the national forest. He didn't report the. No, he didn't, and that was a crazy thing too. Is that he um, he came out of the trail, uh, and then he went and started talking to some members of his family, and when he did, uh, he never even called nine one one. He didn't. 
you know, stop. He didn't call the authorities. He didn't do anything. So, I mean, just that alone was really odd and bizarre. So, y'all ran search, got search warrants on his house and yes, his houses. yes. Find anything there? No, I had the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, Crime Lab. I had the FBI Crime Lab. We had several different agencies um, help out do, with the search warrant. Uh, we were able to grab some some evidence out of the out of her house, out of his house. Everything, of course, was sent off to labs and to be tested. But nothing concrete that you could hold on. No, at that time, no, we didn't. But uh, over the last three and a half years, new information came up, new cell phone technology. Um, we were able to extract some more information from his cell phone, which uh, put him on the trail. We were able to do some more work with her cell phone, and then we were able to, you know, given an approximate um, time that she stopped actual moving any activity from her phone, was on this trail the day before. And so we were able to develop that kind of information and nail him down to it. What, uh, what's it now? I mean, you got all this done. What's finally getting, what was the final point to get to get him now? Getting the warrant. I mean, as far as the, that actually was, was it just the electronics? It, electronics, uh, his, his actions, his statements, his, uh, him denying that he was ever with her. Um, him, you know, we had, uh, I think it was three people that had actually, uh, had information that said that they saw the, the victim with the suspect. Uh, on his four-wheeler. He completely denied it. Um, it was just a lot of little things. Uh, Scott, it was like, it was just, it was a needle in the haystack investigation um, because we didn't have any video surveillance. We didn't have, you know, anything, any other eyewitnesses, you know, that came forward. But over the course of time, we just started getting more and more people involved in it and we never gave up. So as soon as um, this information came to light, um, we went and went right back at it. Tell me a little bit about her. She was, uh, been working for Lonsky at, uh, yeah, almost she, re re ready to retire. Also. Yeah, she was, uh, months from retirement. She had already announced her retirement. She had worked, uh, for TDCJ, uh, for nearly 25 something years. She worked at the Plunsky unit. Uh, she was a, uh, she was a mother. She was a grandmother. Uh, she was, uh, everybody referred to her as the mom at, at work. She was very friendly. She was nice. She kept to herself. Um, she was, you know, a good person. She, you know, and the thing is, is that, you know, even though she wasn't, uh, you know, active law enforcement, but she still worked in the, you know, in the community. So we all took this pretty hard and, and you know, we never gave up. We never gave up. Now y'all talked to the family this morning. What, yes. what was their reaction to this finally? They were, uh, we talked to her daughter. Uh, I talked to her son uh, last night. And um, we talked to other people from the family, but uh, her daughter was very emotional. Um, she was, she never gave up. And, you know, she, she had always supported us. Um, I kept her in the loop on everything. Um, and so she was really just emotionally happy. She was just happy that we were able to get some type of closure, you know, and, and actually get the person that, that was responsible for her death behind bars. What, uh, so, what now, just, uh, see him in court now? Huh? Yeah, if that, um, you know, he, he is older, um, he's not in the best of health now, um, so we'll have to see what happens after that, but we're prepared to go forward and, you know, testify and all that other good now stuff. He's, he's got some history, some assault cases back in Harris County over the years and some, several, multiple DWIs he did prison time. Right? Yes, yeah, he had some, he had, uh, he had some alcohol related DWIs. He had, you know, some, several convictions. Um, he did some time in prison uh, several times. And then uh, I think the la latest was he had a, uh, uh, I think it was a indecency with a child or something, something to do with that. But it was a, it was a sex crime. Was he registered sex offender? Uh, at the time, I, yes, he was. Um, and, you know, I didn't dig deep into that. Um, so I had other things going on. But one of the uh, sex crime detectives was telling me that uh, he, he was a registered sex offender. And um, from that, I can't, I can't, I don't know any more about it. So but he really wasn't under your radar? You he know, wasn't. Radar, radar at all for a while? No. Um, but, but again, he was the person of interest from the very beginning. Now we went through the entire family, we went, went, went through, uh, we even went through uh, TDCJ with uh, past 
inmates, offenders, uh, co-workers. Uh, we, I mean, we turned over every rock that we can, and and we looked for any anything, any kind of signs, clues, whether it was work related, whether it was family related, but everything kept coming back to Robert Clary. Yeah, being with Polinsky, you know, Jeff Rowe, they were. TDC kind of looked at it pretty hard too because they thought possibly you could be involved in that, but they, they were able to determine. Yeah, they were. Also. Yeah, they were. They, they helped us out quite a bit. Um, their investigator and I uh, stayed in contact. Um, They're very open with their investigation too, and uh, you know we had some coworkers had come in. We re-interviewed them, and so once we cleared that angle of the investigation, we started continuing focusing on, you know, uh, inside. The Clary world, and that's and, and everything. And I'm gonna tell you, Scott, everything that we did with the Clary world was, um, you know, it was by the book. So they uh, they had a lot of information about Robert Clary, even though he was a member of their family. But we all suspected it from the beginning. But we're just everything came came together like it was supposed to. You've been stuck on the border and reserves. And yeah, it's kind of. Had work around this. I mean, yeah. when you first left out, you were kind of hoping it was you'd have it cleared up. Before yeah, you left out yeah, ago, so, yeah. So with yeah. that, and then uh, I had another deployment uh, right before that, and you and I had talked, you know, even while I was gone overseas. Um, so between the the military and 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 this, I really I didn't lose focus on the case, and you know, I, I talked to the family. Uh, the sheriff's office was um, re really supportive in making sure that. You know that I had all the information I needed to to continue to work the case, even though I was gone. Anything else you want to add? No, I'm just uh, I'm pleased. It was a long it was a long three and a half years, but um, we got this guy behind bars, and he won't be able to do this to anyone else. Todd, uh, first name, last name, spell sure. please. Sure, Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, Dylan, D-I-L-L-O-N. Todd, tell me about this case. I mean, uh, it's been going on for several so, years now. Yeah, so this this case came to us uh, back in uh, 2019. Um, at the time, I was an assistant district attorney in here. The, 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 when this, how this case came to my attention was uh, the lead detective on this case, Gary Sharpen. Uh, Gary came by my office one day. Our, our office has always been open for law enforcement, you know, to ask questions. Uh, and we, we assist them in any way, shape, or form. Gary came to me and said, uh, Todd, I've got a really weird case, and I'd, I'd really like it if you wouldn't mind coming with me to the autopsy on this case. Uh, so I said, sure. We went down there. Uh, we looked into it. It was very strange for us. Um, the case had there it, it seemed like there was more decomp on one part of her body than there was the rest of it right uh, she's found in national forest um, so that immediately complicates things because then we're working with the forest service we're trying to determine you know what what's going on with this thing um, and it was a very strange scene uh, the the you know it was a scene where it looked like um, something had happened and she just dropped, right? So we pull, we pulled in a lot of resources on this one. The, the autopsy was done in Jefferson County at Southeast uh, Texas Medical uh, Forensic uh, Center. Um, there was limitations on that because of the decomp that was involved. Um, this was May, you know. Um, but we were able to, right away we were able to see some um, we were able to put together some potential suspects, um, and, and there were several. Um, the good thing about this case is uh, my investigator at the time actively participated in this case, helping to find interviews. San Diego County is a small county, you know, um, as opposed to a lot of other counties near us. We don't have police departments. We, we um, all of our constables are one-man shops. The sheriff's office, you know, due to their current uh, uh, funding levels, they can only field three or four deputies for the entire county. And this is a county of 700 square miles. 
So we reached out. Uh, we got, uh, by the end of it, we were working with the U.S. Forest Service Investigative Division. We were working with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Officer Inspector General. Um, we, we worked with TDCJ on this case because Ms. Richardson had been a uh, correctional officer at the Polonsky unit. Uh, we worked. Uh, we eventually wound up working with the FBI, uh, doing forensic analysis and stuff like that. Um, worked with the United States Attorney's Office. Um, we we pulled in all the help we possibly could on this case. Um, and we were in a situation early in this case, uh, about a week or two into this case, and it was all that, all that the sheriff's office worked on, all that all of our partners worked on. We were working this at 100 miles an hour and um, we thought we were right on the cusp of, of having enough information and um, we got some forensic labs back in that just did not read at all what we had anticipated and it stalled out the case um, and and investigating a case is like is like football you know you can lose that momentum and sometimes it's hard after you lose that momentum to pick it back up. Um, but our, our policy at this office is we only lose when we quit. And so we don't quit. Um, we were, this case has always been on forefront of my mind and Detective Sharpen's mind. And we were fortunate enough to um, be able to use some other resources. Um, these were resources that we were able to, to use without costing the public one cent. Uh, helped us reorganize our case, helped us uh, have some perspective, some outside perspective on um, potential suspects, uh, new tactics to go back and re-interview. Um, so we were able to do that. Um, and then, you know, like every investigation needs, a, a good bit of luck. Um, we happened across a, a, a witness in this case um, that we knew was out there but had never been able to identify or locate. Uh, happened across this witness and it really was just the, the last piece of the puzzle that we needed uh, to, to get a, a warrant. Uh, put the warrant together, submitted it to John, John Wells, uh, he approved the arrest warrant. And there there uh, Mr. Clary sits in the San Antonio County Jail as a result. How long do you think it would be tight before it even comes to court? Well, <clears throat> so we, we don't anticipate the suspect getting um, we, we suspect that, that he'll probably be in custody uh, currently. Um, so the first step is going to have to get it. it we're, it'll have to be presented to a grand jury within 90 days. Um, currently, I mean, it, it, it you know, judging, judging, uh, judging how long a case will take to trial, it's, it's always a, a nitpicky su a subject. You can't always do it with any type of level of clarity because, one, uh, there's a defendant behind behind all of this who's making this, the decisions, do I want to go to trial at all? Do I want to plead guilty? Do I want to go to a trial by a judge? Do I have a trial by a jury? What kind of punishment do I want? Um, we would be doing well if we could get this case tried uh, by the end of next year. Uh, San Antonio County, uh, we're one of the last counties that have a uh, judicial district, right? So. We have we share the 258th district court and the 411th district court with Polk and Trinity counties, right? So that means, uh, contrary to what some people think, we don't just have a judge sitting down the hallway who's ready to hear a case every week, right? Um, they'll have a trial week in Polk County, then they'll have a trial week in Trinity County, then they have a trial week here in San Jacinto County. Um, with our, our current, currently, with the way that schedule works, between both of the district courts we have 12 trial weeks per year, right? So all of our felony trials, every case that wants to go to a jury trial have to be funneled somehow into those 12, 12 weeks out of a year. Um, and, you know, as you know, Scott, we're, we're still dealing with a backlog from, you know, COVID and all of that stuff. I mean, next week I'm trying a case that was indicted back in 2017. Um, that's just, that's the nature of the business. Um, so... I think we'd be doing well if we could get this case tried by the end of the year. Of course, you know, violent crimes, crimes against children, that's the priority of this office, uh, bar none. You know, so that, you know, but this is absolutely a priority for my office to try. But 
we will do it all the niceties and all the procedures and complying with due process. Um, a verdict where you know a defendant doesn't have his fair day in court isn't worth getting. So we'll make sure that happens. What about bond? What kind of bond is he being held on now? He's uh, the arrest warrant uh, that Judge Wells handed down. I believe he recommended a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar warrant. Uh, so that's that's fairly standard in our neck of the woods. Uh, bond between seven hundred fifty and, and you know one million dollars for a murder. That's fairly common. What uh, I mean, Gary did quite a bit on this thing. Maybe. Gary's a bulldog. Um, Gary, uh, you know, I, I truly believe that there at certain times this case was held together sheerly by the sheer force of will of Gary and my old investigator, Amy McCorkle, uh, who now works in Montgomery County DA's office. Um, that they, they have not stopped. They have not quit. Um, and, 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 you know, to give even more credit to Gary, this is something that he did while he was deployed um, you know, he's still been trying to actively work on this case, maintain contact with witnesses and the victim's family, while being deployed to the border as part of Operation Lone Star with his National Guard unit. Um, Gary Gary's a heck of a guy, um, and he is very talented in what he did. Um, but a, a large part of this is to Gary specifically and the sheriff's office generally, their dedication and their 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 their. Uh, refusal to quit on this case.